like to take this opportunity to welcome you to uh, this evening service. We are so glad that you are tuning in. Uh, get out your Bibles if you have them. Let's go to Genesis chapter number 35, the book of Genesis chapter 35. And uh, while you're turning there, I'll say you might be watching this on your TV or your, uh, your smartphone, your computer, your tablet. Uh, you might be sitting around your kitchen table. You might be sitting on the couch in your living room. But however and wherever you're watching, we're glad that you tuned in. Uh, and we pray that all is well with you and your family. I'm glad that God can take the frail words that a man has, especially in a time like this, and God can use that to show us eternal truths out of his eternal book. And I'm hoping and praying that's what happens tonight as we get into the word of God. Genesis chapter 35, uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 15. If you would find that there, verse number 15 of Genesis 35, the Bible says here, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Genesis chapter 35 records for us a very sad account in the Bible. Here we find the well-known couple by the name of Jacob and Rachel. And up to this point, Rachel uh, has only given birth to a single son by the name of Joseph. She'd been barren for quite some time before she gave birth to Joseph. And now she finds herself with child again, and she's about to give birth uh, to Jacob's last son, and the scene here in Genesis 35 opens up with Rachel going into what the Bible describes as hard labor. Now, I'm probably the, the least qualified to comment on that, but I'd say all labor is hard labor. And all the mothers out there said, amen. I can hear you through the camera, all right? But Rachel's labor is so difficult, the Bible tells us that she dies not long after giving birth. But before she died, she took that baby boy that she had just given birth to, and she looks at him and she says, I'm going to call him Benoni. Now, we understand that back in the Bible days, your name carried great significance with it. It meant something. Uh, they didn't just give out names because they liked the way that it sounded. You say, well, Brother Corey, what does the name Benoni mean? Benoni means son of my sorrow. In other words, it means sorrow. But I want you to see there is a stark contrast between the mother and the father in these verses of Scripture. Rachel looked at her baby boy and she said, that's the son of sorrow. But the Bible tells us when Jacob beheld his son, and I can just see him in my mind's eye as he, he, he lifts up that brand new baby boy in his arms like any proud father would do. And maybe with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye, he, the Bible says Jacob didn't call him Benoni. But he looks at him and he said, his name is Benjamin. The name Benjamin means the son of my right hand. In other words, it means strength. So here's Rachel. She says, all I see is sorrow. All I see is sadness. And, and all I see is doom and gloom. And it's like a dark cloud that just is looming over everything. But here's Jacob. He's looking at the exact same boy. And he says, I, I see strength not sorrow. I see blessing and not a burden. I see God and not the grave. And for a little while, I want to preach asking this question, are you holding Benoni or Benjamin? The deeper question would be this, what is your perspective? What's your perspective on the situation we are currently in as a church and as a nation? Does the way that you view it please the God who has allowed it to happen? For some, all they may see is sorrow and sadness, and that's mixed with fear and no faith. But I'm praying that the people of God will resolve to be strengthened during this time and will better learn the blessing and the comfort of walking with our God. Are you holding Benoni or Benjamin? That's the thought for this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll get into the message. Father in heaven, uh, we're thankful during times like these that we still have 
avenues like this where we can be connected as a church family. And Lord, as we dig into your word, I pray, Lord, that you would just minister to the needs that are represented among the folks who will hear this. You know what they are, and Lord, I pray that you just use your word uh, to accomplish your will and be with us now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are always at least two perspectives to every situation. And it's just amazing how two people can look at one thing and come to two totally different ideas, two totally different conclusions. And I've used this example before, but I think it's worth telling again. It's sort of like the fellow, he was driving down a country road. And as he's driving, uh, he saw a man sitting on a fence and he thought, boy, that's peculiar. So he went down the road a mile or so and he came back around and looped around and uh, he came back around and that man was still sitting on the fence. And he thought, boy, that's, that, that's just strange. He drove back around the third time and the same man still sitting in the same spot on the same fence. And he thought, all right, that is just plain weird. So he rolled down his car window and he said, hey, man, you're pathetic. All you do is sit on fences and stare at cars. And the man replied and said, well, I don't think we're much different. All you do is sit in cars and stare at fences. Now, can I tell you, uh, here in Genesis 35, you have two people looking at the exact same thing, but they come to two very different conclusions. Folks, there are many different situations that will come in life. And when they come, there are always two different ways to look at them. I would dare say we're in a situation right now as a church, as a country, as individuals, where if we are not careful, we could look at this coronavirus pandemic and the economic fallout that it's causing, and we could get a little fearful, and we could get a little discouraged, and we could get downhearted and defeated and despondent, and we could maybe even become sorrowful because we miss being together as a church family. Or we could make the choice that, you know what, uh, this is out of my control. It's bigger than me and I can't change it. And if I could, I wouldn't have chosen this. Uh, I wish we could meet together in person as a church body and I miss the sweet fellowship and the encouragement. But I know the God who resides over and above it all. He's in control of it all. So I think I'll just trust him. And I think I'll just keep walking with him. And on the other side of it, I know I'll be stronger as a Christian for it. And our church will be stronger for it. Hey, th this thought occurred to me earlier today. Can you picture that first Sunday when we're all back together and we get to sing our hearts out to the Lord? You get to see those little kids running down the hallway going to their Sunday school classes. You get to see our pastor step up here behind this pulpit, open up the Bible and preach, thus saith the Lord. I'm, I get chills on my spine just, just thinking about it right now. But in the meantime, we, we have to go through this period of being separated, don't we? We have to go through this time, and it's just different. It feels kind of strange. Uh, the last two Sunday mornings, I'll be honest with you, I've woken up, and my first thought is, it's Sunday. I mean, it's the Lord's Day. It's time to go to church, and man, that's an exciting thought. And I'll, I'll swing those covers off, and I'll, I'll take my legs, swing them over the side of the bed. But then that first thought is immediately followed by a second thought that drowns out and says, wait a minute, you can't be with your brothers and sisters in Christ today. And it's just not the same. And I've had to ask myself the same question that I'm asking you today, and that is, are you holding Benoni or Benjamin? Are you sorrowful and sighing, or are you rejoicing and relying on the Lord who is your strength? We're going to walk through three examples in the Bible of folks who went through a difficult situation and chose to see their difficult situation from a heavenly perspective. And we'll start right here in Genesis 35. Rachel looked at her son and she said, this is sorrow. Jacob looked at him and said, this is strength. And I want to say out of those two names, Benoni and Benjamin, the name Benjamin prevailed. You see, in these verses, what was sorrow turned into strength. In this life, we're no stranger to sorrow. We all experience it to one degree or another. And I wish I could stand here and say, you're never ever going to experience sorrowful times and discouraging times. I wish I could say that you're never going to get your legs knocked out from under you in life. But that's just not true. Hey, I wish I could say that uh, you're never going to feel like you got kicked in the gut. 
Uh, you're not going to get knocked down. You're not going to get hit by a train that came out of nowhere. You didn't see it coming. It was unexpected. But we all know that happens in life. When those things happen, we can let them destroy us or we can let them make us stronger. We can choose to quit or we can choose to keep pressing on. We can get bitter at God and the church and other people or we can resolve to know that this will pass. And when it passes, we will be stronger for it. Uh, we will learn to draw close to our Lord, to lean upon him. We'll know him more intimately than we did before. You know, there's a certain side of walking with the Lord that we can only come to know through sorrow, through the rough stretches, the difficult times, the challenging times like we are currently in. Folks, let me, let me say, don't waste this opportunity to draw nearer to the Lord. Take advantage of it. You say, Brother Corey, what, what are you talking about? We can't, we can't meet together as a church. What kind of opportunities do we have? Hey, if there ever was a time to try God and find Him true, it's right now. If there ever was a time to prove God and find Him faithful to every promise He ever gave, it's right now. I'd say this to all the men in the families of this church. Now, more than ever, you ought to be the spiritual leader of your home. Yes, the opportunity to assemble uh, as a church body has been momentarily taken away, but we can have social distancing without spiritual distancing, and I believe the men out there ought to lead in that effort in their families. I'm simply saying this, stay close to the Lord through this stretch. Truth is, if, if nothing bad ever happened, we would remain shallow and immature Christians. We tend to not grow during the good times. But it's when the bad times come that we experience the most spiritual growth. James chapter 1 verses 2 tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know what the Bible is saying? It's saying bad times help mature us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And after the bad times and after the sorrow has passed, we will know that God is still good. And we can go to the throne of abundant grace. And we will know that we're capable of getting knocked down and flattened by what life brings, but getting back up and doing what we're supposed to do. Because if it's right to do it when things are good, then it's right to do it when things are not so good. The Christian life doesn't depend on circumstances. It depends on what the Word of God says. And by the way, what this says never changes. And if something is right before the hard time, then it's right during the hard time, and it'll still be right after the hard time. Doing right is always right. Sorrow can make us stronger. That's the example from Jacob and Rachel. So there's their example, and then I want you to think with me for just a moment about Job. Everybody knows the story of Job. Here's a man, the Bible says, he's the greatest of all the men in the East. When you come to the book of Job, the, the greatest man in all the East uh, has been reduced to nothing. He's lost everything like that. He's lost his health, his wealth, his fields, his flocks, his family, and he now sits in the ash heap. And his wife, I'm talking about the one who is supposed to be your strength and your encourager, your best friend, the person you lean on. She comes to him and says, Job, I've got four words for you. Curse God and die. Uh, Job, God doesn't love you. You've done everything right, and this is how God repays you? You know what the Bible says Job's answer was this. He said, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? It rains on the just and the unjust, doesn't it? Think about this. You and I, from the hand of God, we receive good, and we receive good, and we receive good time and time again. Blessing after blessing and life and breath and health, all these things. But when God gives us something that's a little bit bitter, and we don't like the way that it tastes, 
Sometimes we act like he's never done anything good for us. Job saw his situation differently, and he responded correctly. And we know his story. His friends come, they accuse him of, of being a hypocrite. And boy, I'd say old Job was, was going through some sorrow. He's going through a sorrowful time in his life. You find in Job chapter 3, Job curses the day he was born. I don't know about you, but I, I've never had a day so bad that I cursed the day I was born. Job did. You also find in Job chapter 3, Job asked the question, why? Over and over again, why is all this happening to me? Over in Job chapter 5, he says, I wish I could weigh my grief and my sorrow. I wish it could be weighed in the balances. I wish that I could just uh, find a way to let God know how much this hurts. But by Job chapter 10, that same man is saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Further on in Job chapter 23, Job says, I can't see him on the left. I can't see him on the right. I can't see him in front of me or behind me. But I know this. I know that he sees me. And I know that despite my pain and despite my sorrow and my frustration, he is working. And I know this. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. How do you tell fool's gold from the real deal? Well, the fire doesn't lie, does it? Can I say, Christian, testing and trials don't lie. They show us what we really are. The Bible says that God will give beauty for ashes. And when God is working in our lives, like I believe he is now, he's going to burn away all of the impurities that are not Christ-like. And the finished product is, is something that's more pure and something that's better than it was before. Sorrow not only makes us stronger, sorrow makes us better. The Bible says sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. When God does something in your life and you don't understand it and it's a bitter pill to swallow, a lot of times here's what we like to do. We like to point fingers and blame. We try to pinpoint the reason. We say it's got to be because of this person, and we look at others. Can I say, look inward. Don't blame others. You lay that thing at God's feet and you start saying, Lord, what do you want to do in my heart? And I'll be honest, that's what I've been asking the Lord during this time of, of being separated from our church family is, Lord, where does Corey Jackson need to be better? What do you want to teach me? What do I need to change? And ultimately, that's what Job did in his life. He didn't get bitter. He was broken, yes, but brokenness brings sweetness. And that manifested itself in Job's life. You remember that story in the Bible about the, the lady that brought the alabaster box of ointment to Jesus. You know, the sweetness and the fragrance of that odor couldn't come out until when? Until the box was broken. And when God decides to do something in our lives that hurts, maybe, yea, even breaks us, either bitterness and malice and anger could come out or a sweet, sweet fragrance can come out. It's been said that God never uses someone greatly until he hurts them deeply. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. That means there's an established limited time for this. That means it's going to pass. It's going to end. After that ye have suffered for a while, What's he going to do? Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You know what make you perfect means? It means a finishing touch. It's kind of like an artist when he's, when he's painting a picture and he gets to that, that last little bit and he puts that last little bit of paint on that picture. Hey, folks, God allows suffering into our lives because he's not done working on us. He wants to mold us to be more like him. He wants to make us better. He wants to put that finishing touch on our lives. Make you perfect. And then he says, establish. That means God reaches down, picks us up, and puts us back on our feet. And I'm thankful God does that. Then the writer says, strengthen. That's where God's grace comes into the picture. He strengthens us. The last thing it says is, settle you. I believe what we need, especially for such a time as this, is Christians who are just settled. Rock solid. They know 
uh, that God is in control. I'm talking about Christians who can get knocked down and realize God's working on them and let God pick them up and put them on their feet again and let God strengthen them so they can go on. Quickly and then we're done. I want to look at the example of Joseph. We know the story of Joseph as well. Joseph had been sold as a slave. He's been imprisoned by Potiphar. And he now uh, has become second in command in Egypt. His brothers approach him after his father's death. And they beg him not to seek vengeance. They say, Joseph, we did horrible things to you. And we acknowledge that. We did things to you that no one should ever do to their own flesh and blood. How did Joseph respond? He said, God meant it for good. Notice that Job didn't say that it was good. He didn't say that, that getting sold as a slave and getting thrown in that pit was good. And he didn't say that getting lied about was good. And he didn't say that spending years in a prison was good. But he did say, hey, now that I'm on the other side of this, I know God meant it for good. And I can honestly say this, and I know you'd agree with me. Coronavirus is not good. Not being able to assemble as a church, that's not good. But we know all things work together for good. Boy, we, we like the Bible when it says that God is the God of all comfort. And we like the Bible when the Bible says he's the God of all grace. But let me remind you that Romans 8.28 teaches us he's also the God of all things. And who knows, maybe Lakewood Baptist Church, maybe you as an individual, uh, maybe myself as an individual, maybe we'll be a little bit stronger and a little bit closer to the Lord after this current valley we're in. I'll give you this illustration and then I'll be done. There was a young married couple. They were going to paint a room in their house blue. And the wife handed her husband a piece of paper with the exact shade of blue that she wanted for that room. And she wanted him to go down to the store and, and get paint that was that same color. So the husband went down to the store and he saw all the different shades of blue and he was having a hard time finding just the right one. And finally he found a worker there and he said, hey, uh, can I get some help? I need this color of blue. And the man said, sure, no problem, I can help you. So that worker grabbed a bucket of paint and he opened up the lid and he began to put different shades of blue in there. And, and the husband was watching him the whole time. And, and all of a sudden that worker grabbed some black and he put some black paint in there. And that young husband said, whoa, 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 wait, I need blue, not black. I need blue paint. And that worker just looked at him and said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. He grabbed another color. He put that in there. He grabbed another color. He put that in there. And that husband started getting really nervous. He thought, man, I need blue. This guy's putting all kinds of colors in there, black and brown. And I, I don't know if this is going to turn out or not. Well, the worker got done putting all those colors in there. He put the lid on it took it over to a machine, and uh, that machine just shook the living daylights out of that bucket of paint. And when it was done, that worker popped the lid off, and he said, let me see that piece of paper. He put it down next to the paint, and much to the husband's surprise, it was an exact match. And the worker said, I told you, you could trust me. In the Christian life, we bring our bucket to the Lord, and we say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. I want you to be pleased with me. Here's my life. Here's my bucket. And the Lord reaches over and he grabs some blessing and he puts that in the bucket. And boy, we like that. And truth be told, he does that more often than not. But then he reaches over and, and he grabs something and we say, oh, no, 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 Lord. I don't want that in my bucket. Please don't put that in there. And the Lord simply says, trust me. I know what I'm doing. And this is all going to work together for good. And I'm going to get the glory. And along the way, I'm going to teach you some things. And I know this is hard right now. But you need it in your bucket. Church, maybe this stretch for the next month or so is just what we needed in our bucket. And even though it's hard right now, we can trust knowing that God will work it all together for good. Are you holding Benoni or Benjamin? Sorrow or strength? I'm going to say a word of prayer. Pray with me if you would right where you're at. And then we'll be done with today's service. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your word. 
And Lord, truly, we're reminded as we look into it that everything that we're going to go through in life, the answer for it is right here. There's not one subject that's not covered. Lord, I don't know what, what the needs are of the folks that will hear this, and you do. And I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to their heart as you see fit. Draw us closer unto you during this time. Help us to see everything that we're going through from your perspective. And may we as a church, when we assemble once again, may we be that much stronger for it. We love you now. We praise you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.